Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and thanks for joining us on the Phil Cook Podcast. Today, we're going to be interviewing Jason Moore. He's the founder of Midnight Oil Productions. He's a producer uh, based in Dayton, Ohio, actually, and he's written a remarkable new book called, uh, called Both And, Hybrid Worship Experiences for In-Person and Online Engagement. Both and. Remember, the online versus the live is not an either or, it's a both and experience. And he's written a really terrific book, and he's been advising, coaching, working with churches for a number of years on how to really take your online experience to the next level. So you're going to be thrilled with the interview today. He's going to bring you some interesting insights and some practical tips about helping you take your online worship service to the next level. Jason, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I started following you a long time ago when you were focused mostly on video and, you know, the visual stuff that happens in a church experience, but you've expanded into all kinds of areas, and I'm so excited that Midnight Oil, which is your production company, is uh, really getting involved in a a multitude of ways people can experience church in the digital age we live in. Let's go back a little bit and tell me how you got started in all this. Absolutely. Well, uh, Phil, thanks for the opportunity to be on with you. Uh, I've been a longtime fan of yours. I think we met like 20 something years ago at a conference we were both speaking at churchmedia.net or something like that. The truth is that uh, I was uh, in about third grade, uh, discovered that I wanted to be an artist when I grew up, which seems uh, like a very long time ago. Um, And God had gifted me with all these artistic gifts and things. And when I was in uh, my eighth grade year going into my freshman year, I went to a retreat and it was like I heard the audible voice of God tell me that uh, I was to go into ministry. And uh, I had dreams of uh, Hollywood and, and you know, becoming a cartoonist or an animator or doing something. And then God got a hold of me uh, and uh, I just felt my call was to the church and um, it was a little confusing because I didn't feel called to be a pastor and I didn't feel called to be a musician, which um, I have preached uh, quite a bit. And I have also, I uh, was a musician uh, who led a lot of worship, but um, I came upon this uh, United Methodist Church in Ohio called Ginghamsburg and I uh, was an intern. I started as an intern while I was playing in a band. Uh, the guys were like, hey, uh, you're in art school. Here's uh, an opportunity for you to use your gifts. And that turned into uh, a full-time job and a career and uh, helping churches with creativity and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so I, I've gotten to dabble a little in Hollywood, but uh, largely kind of gave that up. Uh, but well, you know, really for the last 20... 20- oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to interrupt and say, you know, one of the big pet peeves of mine is that Christian colleges don't train people to be church media professionals or church communicators. You know, it, everybody, it's all about coming to Hollywood, and which is great. And if God calls you to Hollywood, by all means go. But I could probably name you eight or 10 churches right now that are making feature films. You know, the churches are doing some remarkable stuff. There's guys like, you know, the, you know, Life Church in Oklahoma City that created the Version Bible app. They're doing some remarkable things on video and digital, online, all kinds of things. And there's so many churches like that that are just doing amazing stuff. So I, I totally get why God would call you there. I, I came to LA to be in Hollywood. And while we've done so many, you know, quite a lot of those things over the years, I keep going back and feeling this tug to help the church tell their story more effectively through the media. So I keep going because I get I'm I'm on your wavelength. Yeah, yeah. So um, for about the first 20 years of my career, I really was helping churches think about how to do creative worship, worship that lasts beyond Sunday, really embracing the power of image and story and metaphor and all those kind of things. Um, doing a lot of work with like collaborative worship design. So helping a pastor and a musician and artists and things like that, figure out how do you create a narrative experience of worship where all the pieces connect and it's not just a pageant where everybody gets up and they do their act. And, um, and so I was doing a lot of that work Uh, in 2010. I added kind of to my toolkit uh, helping churches with hospitality I um, do what I call secret worshiper consultations where I show up as a guest and I take extensive notes from the parking lot into the building and uh, really just try to give them the outsider's perspective. There are so many 
Uh, I call it secret handshakes, uh, secret code language, and secret identities that we have in the church. And so I really began to focus on all those things. And then in March of 2020, everything changed in a pretty dramatic way for all of us, but uh, yeah. especially for me. Uh, I think it was over the course of two days, I had six events that I was supposed to go speak at cancel, uh, because of this thing called COVID. And, uh, and the funny reality at the time was that all of the people that called me said, Hey, uh, we'll have you come out and do this in the fall when this is all over. So I got, I had this kind of panicky moment where I said to my wife, I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. Like I make my living as a speaker and a, a coach and a consultant. And I do a lot of work on site. And, um, I had a church that I had done a consultation for in August of 2019, call me kind of the week that they announced that they were going to ask everybody to kind of stay home for a couple of weeks. And so this pastor had had me out and I had done my secret worshiper thing and I'd written them a report and they had put together a plan for really implementing all the stuff that I had shared with them. And they had been living into that plan for a while. And then the pastor uh, heard this news that we can't come to our buildings anymore. And he called and said, Jason, would you be willing to secret worship our online experience of worship? Because we implemented the stuff you told us about what to do in the building, but we can't be in the building now. Would you mind doing that for us? I'm like, uh, truth was, I didn't have a lot going on. (laughs) The world was closed down. So I'm like, sure, yeah, I'll be happy to do that. And I took about two pages of notes and presented them to the pastor on the Monday following the Sunday, the first week of lockdown. And I said, you know, um, guy's name is Jeremy. I said, Jeremy, uh, so much of what I just shared with you really applies to so many churches that all just had to go online for the very first time. I said, would you mind if I turn this into a little article to help people really kind of navigate this season we're in? And so I wrote, he, he was like, sure. I made him anonymous. Uh, And I wrote this little article, like five ways to improve your stream before next Sunday. And this for many people was just the second week they had ever streamed worship online. And it kind of went viral. And all of a sudden, like every day I was getting calls the very next day, I got a call from uh, some Methodists in um, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, a group that I had worked with a lot. And they said, Hey, we saw that article. Would you turn that into a training? Could, could you do this for our conference, uh, our region. And I said, absolutely. And the next day, West Virginia called. And uh, over the course of five days, I had 15 different annual conferences all over the United Methodist Church, which are sort of these regions. And everybody wanted it before Easter because we weren't going to be able to be in our buildings for Easter that year. So I spent in in the space behind me here, this is my basement. I've got this little studio. Uh, I spent... uh, two and three times a day for two weeks doing these uh, webinars. I called it at the time, telling the old story in a new time. And really the premise of the whole training was that um, when you take a book and you make it into a film, you have to do a lot of things to adapt that story, to tell it in a new way. Yeah. And what, what I saw a lot of people doing in the early days of the pandemic, and quite frankly, it's still happening is that uh, we just threw a camera in the back of the room and went about business as usual. And of course, you could never just take a book and project its pages onto the screen and have that be the story. You have to reimagine the story. You have to consolidate it. uh, You have to adapt it. You have to really tell that story in a whole new way. The gospel didn't change, but the way that we deliver it, the way we tell the story had to change. And so I began doing all these trainings and I had the opportunity to probably do that one 150 times over the course of 2020 and 21. And then in the fall of uh, 2020, I started to get a little bit concerned about what happens when we come back to the room. Yeah. Because we, uh, for those who had only been online for a season of months, uh, some maybe six or eight months, uh, we were so used to just talking to the camera. I thought, what's going to happen when we get people back in the room? One of two things I thought might play out. One would be that we would just continue to talk to the camera, which would make the people in the room feel like the studio audience, and they're not going to like that very much. Or I thought what was more likely going to happen was that we were going to turn and talk to the people in the room and kind of forget that the camera was there and really turn people at home into spectators that are disconnected. And, And I really think during the pandemic, we woke them up to what it felt like to be participants in worship, even though they weren't in the physical space. And so 
um, I created a, a new training that I called Both And, uh, Maximizing Hybrid Worship Experiences for People in Person and Online. And uh, that, uh, that ended up being uh, even more successful than the first one. I've done that probably 250 times and uh, ended up writing a book about it, which came out almost a year ago, exactly, uh, February Terrific book. Terrific 14th. book. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my passion really over the last couple of years has been to um, help churches live into this great commission moment that we find ourselves in, that we get to take the gospel to people everywhere. And sometimes that means physically, but sometimes it also means digitally. And I yeah. think of what we're living in right now as a new wineskin opportunity that we our, our core values haven't changed, but the way we express them, the, the wine skin that we wrap it in has to look a little different for this time totally that we're true. in now. Well, it's interesting. You know, I love the title both and because so often, even now it drives me nuts. I get so many pastors and church leaders who talk about either or, you know, Phil, we need to get them back in the building. Got to get people back in the building. And, you know, and I tell them that in today's digital age, particularly a younger generation is going to check you out online before they come and visit. So that begs two questions. One is, if they're checking you out online first, why does your website look so lame? That's, that's one problem. But the second thing is, it's not a matter of in the building or online. It's a matter of however they want to engage you, we need to make it the best possible experience. And so we got, I just love the title, Both And, because it really captures that. Well, thank you. Um, I think, uh, you know, you hit the nail on the head um, with cr trying to create it uh, both scenarios that some people are going to engage with us online, some in person. And yeah. what I've been seeing in the work I've, I've done, um, what has grown out of this book and the trainings is that I have led probably about 250 cohort calls since uh, early 2020, most of the time with about 10 churches in each call. So I've had the opportunity to speak to all these church leaders. And one of the things I've been asking regularly is how many of you have had more visitors in the building since you went online than you did pre-pandemic? Raise your hand and all the hands go up. Online worship is like the taster spoon for in-person worship. Like people are going to try you out. They're going to see if they like the flavor. They're going to worship with you three or four times, uh, maybe for six months online, and then they're going to migrate yes. to the building. But I, I just had a pastor the other day say to me, Jason, we're thinking, about stopping our online worship. And I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, we want people to come back to the building. And I said, friend, I appreciate the, yeah. uh, the concept there, but you know, if my favorite restaurant stops with delivery service, it doesn't mean that I'm going to get in my car and drive to the restaurant to pick up my food. It means I'm going to find another restaurant that offers delivery service because well in the rhythm, the current rhythm of my life means that I don't always have time to go to the restaurant for lunch but I might be able to order on DoorDash or whatever. Not that I order lunch every day, but um, I think we've got to start thinking about, and, and I am very much a both and not an either or. I, I don't think people should only worship online or only in the building, but I think yeah. we've got to think about how do we do it in a way that, uh, the metaphor that I often use is it's sort of like uh, professional sporting events. You know, the game is happening yeah. in real time and all the people in the stadium uh, the people that work in the stadium are there to give the people who are in attendance in person, a great experience, the vendors, you know, the, the yeah. folks that sell the hot dogs and play the organ and all that. And then you've got this whole other crew that are running cameras and in the production booth and their primary focus is on the people who are not in that stadium. Yes. But we're having, we're having a shared experience uh, and that experience is valid for people who are in their living rooms. And that experience is valid for the yes. people who are in the stadium. I agree. Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, during the pandemic, churches started producing, you know, coming in on Thursday or Friday, for instance, and doing a special one hour worship service to film just for filming and that they could put online because they weren't having church was shut down anyway. And some pastors did it. You know, I'm sitting right now at a like a tall bistro table on a stool, and some would do it that way. Others would do it in, on the stage behind the pulpit. Others would do it in the office, a lot of different places. Um, yeah. Now that we're back in the building, pa most pastors have stopped doing that special online experience. And, and that was so cool because it was 100% designed for the camera, for the people at home. So everything was focused in that way. And it made such an incredible impact for people. There's a few churches that we've worked with recently that are still coming in during the week and doing a special service just for their online audience. Um, 
but most have gone back just to, you know, hanging a camera up on the balcony or doing whatever and capturing the live service. What, what, you know, I, I, what are you seeing out there? I, I wish in a way it's, it is a lot of work. I'll give you that. I'll give you, give you that. But I really did. I, I today I miss those special services that were designed just for people watching online. What, what are you seeing out there? Well, in the book, I actually talk about three different methodologies. I call it pre-both-end worship, which is what you're describing, the idea that you yeah. pre-record your online worship. Um, the, the upside of that is that, like you said, you get to give all of your attention to the folks who are not gathered in your physical space. In fact, you don't have to split your attention. You get yeah. to do it all uh, for them. Uh, the second type of uh, both-end worship I talk about is real-time both-end worship. That's live streaming. But it's really live streaming in a way that you are uh, being very considerate of your online congregation, the yes. way that you acknowledge them, the way that you make eye contact with the camera, you use chat, you know, to engage people, you know, all those kinds of things. And the third one that I don't think a lot of people think uh, much about, but might be a really good solution for some folks is what I call post both and worship. And that's the idea that you might actually have cameras set up in the room and record what you're doing as you're doing it rather than pre-produce, you sort of post edit what you've done. Yeah. Um, and some churches don't have fast enough internet uh, to broadcast or stream live. So record it. And then you might even take that and create what I would call a curated experience of worship, which means that it's not every single song that you might sing, not every yeah. single liturgical mm -hmm. element, but you might create like a little podcast length worship experience that you yes. can post after the fact. Um, but I would say the majority of churches these days seem to be doing live streaming or what I would call real time, both and worship. Uh, but the problem is, is so many of them have really kind of lost sight. We've got, I think we've got to reclaim some of what we were living into during the lockdown portion of the pandemic. Because yes. we would we would do things like if you have a prayer request, put it in the chat, or yeah. uh, you can give today in the offering, uh, both here in the room or by using that link that we just put in the chat or on the screen. Uh, I still see a lot of churches that are not really engaging people yeah. in, in any way where they're really talking to folks uh, who aren't physically gathered. And I also like the online host. You know, we we told our our dur during the, the the lockdowns, we told our clients, look. People are tuning in early because they want to make sure they've got the right link. They want to make sure they're set up, that, you know, they're getting the right thing. And so we were seeing people tune in five, 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes or more early before the, the live stream started. So, you know, we were saying, stop putting the countdown clock on the screen. Stop showing a still photo of your church. Have a host, have an online host that encourages people, prays for people, you know, up, gives them announcements and develop that relationship. And very often I've seen that now we're going back back to live live streaming, they've dropped the the online hosts. And you're exactly right. So many of those ideas that, you know, we, we did during the pandemic need to stick. We need to stay with it because they're really, really a powerful experience for the people at home. Yeah. I, I think one of the key things to really um, make the most of this moment and, and really propel it forward into the future is to recognize that our online worship is about relationship building. Yeah. And if you don't do anything to build a relationship with your online congregation, then they're never really going to migrate from online to the building. They may watch, yes. they may, they may not. Um, and one of my examples uh, when I was teaching in the early days of the pandemic uh, for people to check out and, and uh, use as a model was Mr. Rogers. You know, Mr. Rogers was so good. He built a relationship with, the audience. When I was a kid, I would sit in front of that TV and I felt like Mr. Rogers was my friend. And we had yeah. these conversations and uh, he always looked at the camera. The camera was always pushing in, you know, he would give time. He would ask a question and give you time to mentally respond to that question. And, you know, all of those things. And I think that we just are so focused on the room because in the room we can see people, yeah nod and smile or, or, or frown or whatever, we get some kind of response. Um, what I've been reminding people of, or maybe uh, helping them see for the very first time, is that there are three ways that people participate in our worship today. We've got people right now in the room with us. 
we've got people right now online with us if we're live streaming. And then the third group, we don't give as much thought to, but they're a really important and growing group are those who worship with us later online. Yes. And what happens is we tend to give all of our language to group number one right now in the room. Yes. So we'll say things like, let's stand together for the reading of scripture. Let's stand together and sing. Yes. Do we really do we really think that people in their living room are standing up in that moment? Probably, Probably not. not. Yeah. And and by saying that, we really I think clue the online group into the fact that we're not really thinking of them. So I encourage yeah, people to so develop true. both and both and language, you know. So if you're here in the room, I'm going to invite you to stand or if you're worshiping with us at home right now, find a posture that will allow you to fully participate in this moment. Good. Um, or like when it comes to prayer, if you'd like to pray with someone today, you can come down front. We've got care pastors that would love to pray with you. If you're worshiping with us online today, we've got care pastors in the chat. And if you're worshiping with us at a later time, you can drop your prayer request in an email that we've just put the link on the screen or in, uh, along with the description of this video. And someone will reach out and pray with you this week if you'd like that, or we'll pray for you this week. Uh, let's good. think about how to make worship evergreen because people yeah. can encounter it at any time. That is so true. And you know, th this has nothing to do with our conversation so much, but I, it is funny to me that pastor after pastor after pastor are telling me now, you know, people are coming back after COVID, but I don't recognize a single person. I, I talked to a, I, I talked to a worship leader recently in Pittsburgh and he said, you know, our church is packed, but I don't, I'm looking out there. I don't, I don't know anybody. And it's like during the pandemic, we got to see all these live streams and think, hey, maybe I like that church better. I like that church better. And people, there's been a massive sh church shift out there during the pandemic. Yeah. I, I had a pastor tell me, um, he said it was this funny moment where I walked up to this new couple and I introduced myself and they looked at me like, uh, yeah, we know who you are. We've been worshiping with you online forever. It, you know, it's, it's, uh, sort of like going to see a committee like Jerry Seinfeld and yes. introducing yourself. Like, yeah, I know why you're here. You know, we're here because we saw you on TV. Like Jerry doesn't have to introduce himself. Uh, we're, we know who he is already because we are familiar with his work. And I think that's so true for people. So our online worship is really a, almost an evangelistic opportunity. I yes. wouldn't say that it's only an evangelistic opportunity because I think people can have real actual worship, um, which is one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of the term virtual worship. Some, some folks talk yeah. about online yeah. as virtual and I think about virtual as simulated, you know, I've got one of those virtual reality right. headsets and you know, yeah, you don't feel, um, any of the wind in your face when you ride a roller coaster, you don't feel the the, the yes. G forces or any of that. But um, the connection you feel to somebody when you're on it with them is very real. So let's not think of online worship as a simulation or fake worship. It's actual worship. It's just digitally delivered. You know, and going back to a, a earlier comment you made about uh, past, pastors dropping their considering dropping their live stream. Um, I, my feeling is, look, if there's only five people watching your live stream, if those people, five people showed up at your church, you would roll out the red carpet. You'd be thrilled to death. You would be so excited. So why don't you get that excited about five people watching online? I mean, I just right. think that you just never know what could happen out there. So um, I just don't see any reason at all to drop a live stream from a church because it's just so it's easy to do. We've got it figured out. Most, you know, 90% of churches out there do it really real, well now, or at least pretty well. And, um, if, if they're not, they're in trouble with me, but, um, they should be doing it well. And, uh, so I think, yeah, I, I just really feel like it's imperative that we continue this. Yeah. And, you know, I would say, uh, as a, as a fellow production guy with very high, production standards and, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and all those kinds of things. Uh, one of the things I've been saying a lot during the pandemic is that I really believe authenticity matters more than being slick or perfect. So Absolutely. I've seen people take a smartphone and do really compelling worship where they're connecting and making people feel like they're a part of it. And I've also seen churches with fancy, you know, dollies and, you know, uh, all these incredible yeah. camera rigs and stuff where it doesn't feel like I'm worshiping at all. It feels like I'm exactly. watching a, a TV program. And so um, that's one of the key things that I'm trying to get people to think about is how do we move people from being watchers of worship online to worshipers online? You know, and that's, a, I can tell you from just being here in Hollywood, by the way, that, that 
there are people regularly doing feature films on iPhones. Um, th- th- somebody told me the other day there's a couple film festivals in the U.S. just for movies shot on iPhones. And so, yeah. uh, you know what? Don't complain that you don't have the gear, that you don't have the equipment. If you've got a phone in your pocket, you've got a mobile TV studio, and you could be live streaming. So I just think, you know, be encouraged if you're a small church. Absolutely. And, and I just want to pick back up on your comment about the five people that are watching. Yeah. Uh, you may have people, five people watching in real time, but what I'm hearing from all the churches I work with is that the numbers grow through the week. Uh, yeah, I was just um, about three weeks ago, I was in New Orleans and I was uh, doing uh, training there. And the pastor of this church said last night, somebody got on our uh, stream, our live stream from December 18th, and they took the time to watch the whole thing and they commented about how great the service was, and they're watching worship that happened a month ago. Yeah. Um, I, I try to remind folks, or again, just help them see if they've never seen it before. Uh, my my favorite phrase these days is that worship online or both and is here and there and now and later. Yeah. In other words, it's here yeah. in the room, it's there at home or wherever you're worshiping from, your hotel room, your vacation, your uh, on the bus, wherever you're at. Uh, it's also right now as we're doing it, and it also resonates later. Uh, I remind folks that Paul's ministry was hybrid ministry. You know, all throughout the gospel, um, as in, in in Acts, you know, Paul is preaching to the people in person, and then he finds himself in prison. He begins to write these letters, and uh, he's he's leading the church. He's preaching to people through these letters that he's not going to physically deliver to them. Like somebody's going to read them to them. Um, and Paul constantly says, I long to be with you. I wish we were together. I'd prefer yeah. to give you this message in person, but since we can't do that, here's this technology. But what I also want to, to really help people see is that the gospel resonates just as much today as the day that Paul was, was penning those letters that we have come to, to love and that have formed our faith. Uh, and so in the same way, your worship that you do this Sunday can have just as much impact a year from now when someone encounters it. That's a good so point. So even if you have five viewers that are live, you may, over the life of that message that you put online, reach hundreds of people that you will never really know um, in the same way that Paul would never have known uh, all of the things, all of the people yeah. that his his letters would have reached, you know. Okay, so all of this stuff is in your book, Both And, Maximized Hybrid Worship Experiences for In-Person and Online Engagement. Now, I, and I encourage people to get it because this is one great reference book where all this stuff is, is just wrapped in one big, amazing package. But there's a sequel. Tell me about the sequel. <laughs> There is a sequel coming this fall. Can we announce I'm it? Am I okay to announce it? We can. We can. Yeah. I think you're the first person I've I've talked to about it. So that's uh, first person uh, publicly anyway. Um, I'm writing a book right now. I, the working title is Both And Hospitality. And we're going to talk about how do you create an experience of worship in the building and online where you extend the kind of hospitality that really does build relationships um, I really believe that we have to earn the second, third, and ongoing visits. Yes. And too often, the worship that we do is very insider. And so uh, I'm going to talk about things like uh, getting uh, past our secret identities, our secret code language, our secret handshakes, you know, all these things that we do that in person uh, and online, really, um, it may take someone years of hanging out with us to ever figure out like, what's that thing they always say after they read the scripture or what's that yeah. thing they all grab hands and they say a thing together or um, let's be intentional about um, guiding people and, and giving them orientation and helping them feel seen and, and heard and, and welcomed. Um, I liken it a lot to uh, tr- air travel. Uh, I grew up in a household where we drove everywhere for vo- vacation when I was a kid and it was, I was 21 the first time I got on an airplane. And I remember just intently listening to every single thing that flight attendant said at the beginning about seat belts and oxygen masks and floor level lighting and emergency exits and all that. Right. Now I fly like six times a month. Um, I don't sit and intently listen to that anymore, but I remember every time I'm on that plane that there's probably somebody on here that needs this. They, they need to yeah. hear it. 
And, and so I'm trying to get folks to remember that we have first time flyers with us, both in the building and online. And how can we set them up for success in what we do? That's really good. You know, your, your secret handshake comment is really, really good because we have in the marketing world what we call secret knowledge. And secret knowledge, that, that term simply means because I know something is true or and I know how this works, I just assume everybody else does. So if I'm writing a television commercial, um, I should, you know, I need to understand, I know about this product and how it works and what it's for, but the people watching the TV commercial don't know anything about it. And so I have to be careful to explain. So often we just assume everybody knows, we, we assume everybody knows where the nursery building is, or we know where the high school kids go or where the adults go. We just assume that, you know, that people know where parking is. And um, we don't take the time to really make them, help them understand and feel comfortable. And I'm telling you, the, the, in the, the distracted world we live in, that is more important than ever. And, and besides, you know, um, it, the my, famous Microsoft study that when you meet somebody for the first time, you decide what you think of that person in the first eight seconds. So that means, you know... It, I, I liken it to say, you know, in that world, I don't care how anointed the pastor is. I don't care how great the worship music is. In an eight-second world, what's the parking experience like? You know, what does what your lobby look like? Who's the first person a new visitor meets when they walk in the door? Because in the world we live in today, most people will have decided what they think of your church long before they get to their seat. So yeah. all those hospitality issues suddenly are more important in the digital age we live in than ever before. So the timing of your book is just going to be amazing. Well, I, I, I certainly hope so. I hope it's helpful. Um, I, I often use kind of the metaphor of going to a restaurant for the first time. Uh, you can go to a restaurant. If it takes forever to get seated, they don't refill your drinks. The waiter, waiter isn't very friendly. Even if you order your food and it's the most incredible food you've ever had, you may choose not to go back because the service around that food, the hospitality... Mm -hmm. Um, was not very good now, but I think the opposite is also true. You can go to a place where the food is okay and the service is incredible. And you might say, you know, food's not so great, but I love the atmosphere. Yeah. I love the way I'm treated when I'm there. I always joke, uh, if you've ever gone to Chuck E. Cheese, you know, you don't go there for the pizza, you go there for, That's for, sure. <laughs> for the experience, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah. So how can we do that both online and in, in the building? That's what we're going to that's what I'm about. You know, it's funny. It shows you how grumpy I am that there is a sweet spot. You know, I've been to churches where I walked in, nobody said a word to me. You know, I didn't feel welcome. No, nobody cared. But then I'm at the churches that are trying a little too hard. You know, those churches where people line up and they cheer you when you walk in the door and they're just, they're doing it a little bit too much. And that makes me feel ju just as icky uh, going into that. So there is a sweet spot of making people feel welcome without going either to either extreme, when I, which I think, you know, your book is going to be all about. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah. My, my, uh, my joke when I'm uh, presenting this live, when I'm doing a training on this is that one of two things happened to me, either nobody talks to me or it's like a zombie horde and they're all coming to eat my brain because 40 <laughs> people come to talk to me. Sure. And it's like, have you never had a visitor here before? Like this is uncomfortable, you know? So there is, yeah. the, there is kind of that sweet spot you have to find. And, and we're going to help people kind of tackle that and figure out how to, how to do it. Okay. So for pastors, church communicators, church leaders out there that are watching or listening right now, Leave, it, leave us with a thought. If there was one thing you could convey to church leaders, particularly communicators and, and uh, communications people, what, what would you say? Well, uh, there's a quote that I use a lot in my training and, and that uh, is in the book as well. Um, I, I live in Dayton, Ohio. Um, the Imes Pet Food Company was started in a little uh, suburb in Dayton, and the man that kind of put that company on the map was a man named Clay Mateel. Clay uh, took it from a little family-owned business to a national brand. They they actually moved out of Dayton years ago, and they're this big, everybody knows Imes now. Um, not far from where I live, down the street, there is a business center that he created. And there's a quote on the wall that uh, I just find so inspirational. He says, the only difference between a rut and a groove is how long you've been in it. And I think that the pandemic forced us to find a new groove. And yeah. I think some people did a great job of adapting and the church has never been so malleable. But the problem with a groove is if you stay in it too long, it gets so deep that it's hard to get out of it. And then it becomes a rut. 
And my concern, uh, my challenge, my my thought uh, that I hope would inspire folks is that it's it's important that we continue to look for new grooves. That we can't yeah. do, we shouldn't. Our worship shouldn't look like 2020 right now. Yeah, it's pre-pandemic. It shouldn't look like yes. late 2020 when we were all at home. It should look like what's next. And so I want to encourage people That's to iterate word. forward, not revert backward. You know, as we come out of this this period. The pandemic period. I am. I, I'm very excited because I hear so many pastors saying, "Well, hold on a second. You know, we pretty much done church for the same way for the last 200 years. Maybe it is time we shake things up." And so I'm seeing a number of pastors out there. Try, and I don't mean just you know changing the bulletin out. I'm you know we're talking about switching the order of service. We're doing a different kind of service. They're just really experimenting, and I think that's the best thing that could possibly come out of this whole pandemic is that um, we're going to relook at what worship really means and how to do it in the 21st century, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, this is a time for us to embrace, not a time to run away from or or just to—I I, I hope that people don't see hybrid ministry as just something that got us through the pandemic— but really a new opportunity uh, to, to be uh, the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, even though some of, sometimes that's going to mean digitally. So true. Well, listen, Jason, thanks for coming on. I, this has been fantastic. We're going to put a link to the, your book, a link to Midnight Oil in the, in the show notes. And uh, I encourage people to go check it out because it's a terrific, terrific book and monitor what you're doing. You're doing workshops all over the country on, on hospitality, on media, all different kind of stuff. And so I encourage people to go on uh, Midnight Oil, see when the, if there's a workshop or a session coming near you and go check it out because this is really important stuff we need to be thinking about. So thanks so much for being on. I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful that Jason would join us today. I just think that we need to keep pressing. Uh, if you're a media person or a communications person at a church or on, on the pastoral staff, keep that online engagement on your priority list. We just need to keep that moving because the world is not going to change in that direction. The internet is not going away and we need to engage people online as, as effectively as we possibly can. And along that line, remember my book, Ideas on a Deadline, How to Be Creative When the Clock is Ticking. Uh, this is going to be a book that's going to amp up your creativity to a whole nother level. You can either get it from us here at Cook Media Group or the Influence Lab for a donation to our Influence Lab, which is our nonprofit that helps churches and ministry organizations and Christian leaders around the world use media more effectively. You can go to influencelab.com, find out more there and order the book there. And we'd love for you to order multiple copies. We'll make you a deal because we want you to get it into your team, your small group, working with your creative group, whatever this can really make a difference for you. So in the meantime, we'll see you next time on the Phil Cook Podcast.